Mr. Blackstone, thank you so much for meeting with me today. Absolutely. No problem. So let's talk about these unprecedented times we're going through right now. It seems like every sport is culminating into one. You got the NBA, the NBA finals wrapping up. You have the MLB playoffs in the postseason. You have the NFL in full swing. What is this like for a sports journalist during this time? <clears throat> it's almost uh, hard to digest because there's, there's never been this much on the plate um, at one time uh, with such consequence. I mean, everything you mentioned, um, those are, you know, this is a postseason. We just finished up the WNBA postseason. We, we just had the NHL um, and we've had uh, everything. But it's also a little bit disturbing because uh, you know that the only reason this is happening is because we're in this global pandemic. Um, uh, people get sick. Uh, sports that are unable to contain their travel and their contact, um, like football, um, are having to suffer through the, the ravages of this disease before our eyes. Um, uh, we had it seep into the the French Open because the French Open did not take the type of precautions that were taken at the U.S. Open where um, basically everyone was in a bubble. Um, so uh, on the one hand, it's, it's great to see sports because we love sports. Um, but on the other hand, we know that this is a very dicey situation. Yeah, it is. Like you said, we've already seen outbreaks. You know, in the NFL, we're just seeing this Tennessee Titans, their whole situation where – they've been not following the protocols set in place and they've been paying the consequences for it. Right. And so this is really crazy because what are you going to do with a team like that? And now we see Stefan Gilmore, all these other athletes and all these other teams start to have outbreaks. Like Kevin, what do you think is going to happen with the NFL? Well, I don't think the NFL is going to end up having a, um, a, a normal into the season. Um, I don't think every team will be able to play 16 games. Um, I think there's a good chance that uh, as much as the NFL doesn't want to do it, that they wind up um, heavily penalizing the, the Titans with maybe forfeiture of a game. Um, um, I just think it's, you know, it's very, uh, it's a very risky business right now. Um, I don't know how you play um, a collision sport like football <clears throat> with so many people, you know, 1,500 players in the league, countless hundreds that it takes to put on, um, put on a game on game day. Um, I, I just don't see how you, you're able to, you know, able to contain it. And, you know, one of the unfortunate things about the athletes, um, particularly in football and particularly in the NFL, is that they play for their paychecks week to week, you know, game to game. And for fans who have ever doubted that football players um, work hard um, and are diligent about, their, about doing their jobs, um, this is a reminder or this is proof that, that they really are. I mean, because it's so, it, it's inculcated in professional athletes um, to always work at their craft. And here they are putting their livelihoods and their health on the line um, because they're so addicted to working on their craft um, on their own um, mm -hmm. when, when practice is over, when, when there is no practice. Um, and so now you're expecting them to all of a sudden flip that switch um, and no longer behave as they've been taught to behave um, for so much of their lives. So, um, you know, it's really difficult. You know, it's difficult for all of us to, uh, to restrict um, what have been our normal life routines. And we're just seeing it play out with them. Yeah. I had one of my former teammates. He played at Boston College. He's a captain there. He described it playing football as a tunnel vision. Like, mm -hmm. while you're in it, you're only thing, the only thing you're focused on is playing ball. And mm -hmm. so now we're seeing, like, wow, this is – just blowing up into something that we've never seen before. And it's just insane. Like yep. it's insane that it got to this point, mm -hmm. but Mr. Blackstone. So you're also a professor at the Philip Merrill school of yep. journalism in uh, Maryland. Now, are you taking classes right now? 
Um, we are. We're I'm teaching uh, teaching my class on Monday and Wednesday mornings, um, uh, virtually, uh, just like you and I are. Um, and I'll be doing the same for my class next semester. Um, you know, until we can get <clears throat> some comfort level um, in terms of dealing with this dealing with this uh, this infection. Um, yeah. So we're just making it yeah, making it work as best as we can. How difficult is that for you? Are you more of a get to know you kind of professor or is this like no big problem for you? Uh, no, it, it definitely took some, takes some adjusting uh, to get used to. It's um, a lot, er it's a, I'll say it's easier this semester than it was last semester because last semester obviously we had no idea what was happening. Um, um, kind of just thrown into the fire really yeah yeah so you know this semester we've had a we've had i've had time to plan um to uh, add some bells and whistles to um to virtual conversations um that that sort of thing it, it'll be but it will be harder still next semester because the in the uh spring semester is when i teach a skills course on um on sports, sports reporting and, and sports writing, which, which generally has included having students go out and actually cover games. Hmm. Um, so one, we'll have to see what games there are to cover. Um, and two, we'll have to see if we're even at, allowed to cover them um, yeah. because media will be restricted in a lot of ways. And not only that, but there'll be a lot of restrictions on whether or not the university will allow students to go out and interact with the public um, as a part of their coursework. So um, it'll be a challenge. I haven't quite figured out how I'm gonna do uh, next semester because I just, I just don't know what the, what the parameters are gonna be. Yeah, and I think a lot of people are just trying to take every single day, just a new day and just trying to basically survive. So it's really hard to like plan ahead that far right. into the future. I understand that. Mm -hmm. I read your article on the SEC conference and their whole visions and mindset on scheduling the season. Mm -hmm. And you kind of relate it back to Friday Night Lights with Booby Miles. And mm -hmm. when the booster said that N word won't break. Mm -hmm. Now, with, with everything that we've seen going on, you know, with the start of the SEC, and some players opting out, some players contracting COVID. You got a situation at LSU where the coach comes out and says nearly the whole team has had COVID at some point. Mm -hmm. Is your mindset still the same on this? Absolutely. I mean, the, the big difference between college football and, and the NFL is that uh, the NFL are they're professional, they're professional um, uh, uh, players. Um, they're represented by a union. Um, they can bargain for their protections. Um, you're playing in college. Um, you, you don't have that choice. Um, sure, you have the choice to, uh, to opt out in this situation, but <clears throat> you're not treated like an employee, which is what you should be treated, treated like. Um, you don't have the health care protections. Um, that's at the whim of the university uh, at which you're enrolled and, and play, play your sport. Um, uh, and, you know, I think, I think athletic departments, college football coaches kind of prey on the desire, your desire to play football. Like, as you mentioned, that tunnel vision, they, they, they lock that in, um, you know, even to the, even to the extent of trying to reassure you that if you get COVID as an athlete, that you won't suffer from myocarditis, which is, um, which becomes a, a condition, uh, I guess an inflamed heart, which can damage the heart mm -hmm. um, and cause sudden cardiac arrest. So <clears throat> it's, it's, it, it, it's really different and, and really troubling um, uh, at the collegiate level, because we know that the only reason to bring back football or bring back basketball is to generate revenue. Mm -hmm. There's no, there's no reason um, that that has to happen for a college campus to function. Um, 
it's you know it's the it's a very unholy marriage that colleges have you know as between what is ostensibly um, uh, a mission towards higher education tied to um, this fall nonprofit um, uh, institution known as college athletics mm -hmm. um, and so yeah i mean i think i, I think it's um, i think it's really it's really disturbing what what college athletics has done with with football and is about to do with basketball yeah so you're a columnist for the washington post i kind of want you to look into the future now and tell me what would what would a headline be for this day and age with college athletics with covid with everything going on what would a headline be 50 years in the future looking back at this time probably probably you know something like uh can you believe they actually did this right i mean can they can you believe that they actually shut down college campuses for for students faculty and staff for the most part out of fear that um people could get sick and infect other people um with this um uh, with this deadly disease um, yet, um, they wave their arms to bring back college football um, players, and in some cases, some athletes in some other sports, but mainly, mainly college football players, um, under the guise that they would be safer and better cared for um, on the college campus playing football than they would be if they were treated like what we thought that they were on campus, which is students like everyone else. So, <clears throat> you know, I just think it's, you know, it's exposed the disingenuousness um, on the part of those um, who, who run college athletics and particularly college football um, and what they think about the athletes who play those, who play that sport. And yeah, and you know, and it takes on a, particularly disturbing um, look when you realize that most of the people who run college football, you know, are white males and the majority of those who play the game um, are black males. Mm -hmm. And uh, so for anyone who is disturbed by the analogy to a plantation system, um, then I, I would argue fix the picture that I'm looking at um, and don't try and fix my description of it. I agree. I agree a hundred percent. And just, it's crazy because we've seen outbreaks happen on big 10 campuses and we've seen these athletes still come out and say that they want to play. Like I know at Penn state, Ohio state, Northwestern, your alma mater, like we've all seen mm -hmm. these outbreaks and these athletes still want to play. It's just, it, it doesn't really make sense to me because I look at all these guys who say they want to play, but they're in the situation. And when I played college football, like it was always a joke, like, ha, ah, like this is hell. Like we don't really want to come out here and do this every single day. And I can't imagine that in a global pandemic, these athletes would change their mindset. Like to me, they would just be enhanced and they would say, no, like, why are we doing this? Why are we here? We're in a pandemic. I feel sick. My roommate just caught COVID. Like, what am I doing? Mm -hmm. here? So it's just insane to me. I don't really see like, it's just, I mean, it just comes back to what you said. Like this is a money driven industry and everybody's gotten so blinded by the money that we're forgetting that we're human beings in the end. No, yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, maybe one of the positive things that will come out of this is, uh, <clears throat> is there will be some uh, collective organization for, for college athletes um, um, so that they can have representation at the table. Um, and so they can get a voice. They need a sure. voice. Get a voice and, uh, and, and, and get some equitable treatment from the people for whom they, they toil. Kevin, why is it taking so long for this conversation to start? Or has it always been there? We've just now seen it come to the forefront. Um, well, I mean, I think this is a, you know, this is a different, this is such a different theater that 
it it exists in but it's been a conversation people have had this since the since the 80s um at least um uh, and, and actually episodically throughout the last century um this is you know this has popped up um but this is just a different completely different uh theater now and the Klieg lights are on and everyone can see that the emperor is not wearing any clothes mm -hmm. um and so it's really really uh, it's impossible to ignore i saw you posted an article back in 2018 talking mm -hmm. about Duke and Wendell Carter Jr. Now you said that basically what we're saying is time for student athletes to start being compensated for what they're worth. And mm -hmm. I was wondering what kind of steps do you think the NCAA should consider when they're handling this name, image, and likeness bill? The first thing they, that needs to be done, I alluded to this earlier, is that there needs to be a recognition that, um, that student, that student athletes, um, college players, are um, employees. Um, that, that, that's the very first recognition that needs to be, to be made because unless and until that recognition is made, um, college players can be treated any way, whatever college they happen to attend um, wants to treat them. So that, that needs to be an acknowledgement. The other reason it needs to be an acknowledgement is because the NCAA um, understood the importance of that sort of messaging um, in the 60s, which is why the phrase student athlete, um, student athlete um, was developed. Um, Walter Byers wrote about it. Walter Byers is the, is the architect of the modern day um, NCAA. And, he, he wrote about it in his book um, in the 1990s after he retired as head of the NCAA, um, that he wanted to shield um, institutions and the NCAA from college players who, who may want to sue it under the auspices of employment law in this country. And so I don't really talk that much about compensation as much as I talk about that idea of treating college players like like employees because if you think about it that way it's a it's more holistic you're talking about <clears throat> health and well-being um you're talking about um long-term care um you're, you're you're talking about um greater comp you're you're acknowledging that there is a compensation system right now which is basically a return to labor um with um, tuition room and board, but you're talking about expanding that because that's not, um, that's not equitable. Um, it's not equitable when your coach um, and your athletic director um, are turned into millionaires off of your, your blood, sweat, and, and tears. Um, you should be um, able to cash in on that uh, as well. Um, you know, there should be some protection uh, long term for you should you suffer CTE. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and right now there isn't any. Um, you're going to, you know, chances are, um, if you play college football, at some point you got hurt. Um, your injury may, could be considered a pre-existing con pre condition. Um, by an insurance company, health healthcare insurance company going forward. Um, so who's going to pay for your health care? So that's why we need to, it needs to be a more universal approach to this idea about um, treatment of college players. Um, it, it really needs to be a discussion about, um, about equity, right? And, and not simply do we pay them or, or do we not? So it's really a question about equity. So Kevin, I wanna talk about your journey to becoming a sports journalist. Mm -hmm. So when did you first decide on this career path? Uh, I really just fell out the sky. I, I had no desire to, to write about sports, but I was offered 
I was offered a chance to um, go over to the sports department at the Dallas Morning News when I was there to write about the business or the economics of sports <clears throat> and also to write a column. And um, I said, okay. And that's literally the way it happened. It wasn't, it wasn't, it was not at all in plan of mine. So it's kind of just like sports is your specialty per se, but then you're passionate about just covering everything, every, every little facet of life. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is, this is what journalists do. You know, we, um, we mine the most uh, important commodity on the planet earth, which is information. Mm. And then we figure out how to distribute it. Tell me about your first story. I read it about it in one of your articles. You were at Permian High School in Texas, right? Oh, Permian, Permian High Permian, School? Permian, yes. Yeah. It was a feature story, um, which I don't really do much. I mean, I, it, it wasn't a, a, a business of sports story and it wasn't a column. Um, it was a feature story and the reason, but the reason I got sent was because I was a, it was a story that had to do with race. Um, it's a story that birthed Friday Night Lights. Um, it was um, the book Friday Night Lights by Buzz Bissinger had just come out. And uh, that part of West Texas in the panhandle was very upset with his book. Um, there were death threats issued against him. Um, he didn't return to, to, uh, that part of Texas for, for the, the first football game of that high school season. And so I just went out there and hung around for about a week and wrote a story about what the town was going through, what the people who were written about, how they felt, um, and kind of just, uh, I think just kind of told a story about, um, what was really a self-inflicted wound. Um, by the adults in that community. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about what the perception was down there from that book? Odessa is um, a quintessential um, Texas uh, high school football town where the, the very successful high school football team is really treated by the residents there like um, the Cowboys would be, would be revered in in um in dallas uh, that's their pro team um and they exalt the athletes who who star for that team and uh, they're very very proud of that um, but they had no idea that their culture had really turned the priorities of rearing kids and um and observing sports um, upside down. I mean, they had really perverted everything about that. And, and I think they expected that their story would be one of glory, mm -hmm. right? And that they would be celebrated when people read this book. Um, but it was anything but that. It was, it was a piercing critique of of the racism the the upside down you know priorities that that existed in that in that uh in that community and so you know they are exposed to the world mm -hmm. and they were extremely upset about that and it took them a while to even understand the truth of what was in that book you know buzz's book was um a real expose yeah and, uh, you know, it, 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 it um, exposed, um, it, it exposed a lot about foot, high school football coach culture in general, um, but really specific problems within the community of, of, um, of Odessa. I mean, they had a lot of isms going on um, that that they thought I think were just, it was just, just normal practice. And, you know, they also thought that they were doing their black athletes some sort of favor by um, allowing them to play for this team, which, you know, gave them an opportunity to get college scholarships and, and even more. But, you know, Booby Miles was a perfect case that 
it showed that they didn't really care. As soon as he was no longer valuable as a black body, um, they all but disposed of him. Yep. Sad. It's a sad fact. And this is like, it's been around the country for a while. Like not just in Odessa, Texas. Like I know some of my friends who have gone through the same thing where they're idolized and praised for their good deeds on the field, but then they get hurt and it's, he's just another black athlete. And it's really sad to hear that story and just like see it. Cause I've seen it with my own two eyes and it's really sad, but you just hope, you just got to hope that something is going to change in the future. Like mm-hmm. it's the only thing. So back to your story. So I watched you on around the horn mm-hmm. your battles, your famous battles with Woody Page, Tim Kalashaw, <laughs> J.A. Adande. Shoot. The list goes on. Israel Gutierrez. Like, I love mm-hmm. that. What is that like for you? Oh, it's a lot of fun. I mean, that's something else that just, you know, that just kind of fell out the sky, was in the right place at the right time. And, um, you know, ESPN wanted to start doing this show. And, uh, after, you know, and I started doing it early on. And um, I thought when it st- show first started, it really wasn't my cup of tea. I thought it was a horrible show and it wouldn't last very long. And here we are, you know, a generation later, basically, and it's still, it's still blowing and going. So, no, it's it's a lot of fun. I think one of the things that people don't realize about the show is that it takes a lot more than just sitting down, sticking a microphone on your chest and a, a receiver in your ear and just start talking about the whatever topics are on the on the plate that day. Um, it's a heavily produced show. Um, guys start the, the producers and directors start thinking about it eleven o'clock the night before. Um, oh my god they're in the you know they're in the studio by eight o'clock in the morning um trying to figure out what the topics are going to be and how they're going to structure the show finding video and still pictures and audio to to go along with the show um you know tony uh you know we have conf- a conference call that goes on for an hour or so in the morning discussing what they want to put in the show or what we want to put in the show or what we don't want to put in the show you know, Tony Reale writes a script um, uh, that he uses throughout the show. Then you got to sit down and they have to do the camera work and everything. So it is a, you know, it's, um, it's quite a Whole production. production. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's quite, it's quite a production and um, yeah. And then you got to sit down and, you know, and do it. Um, but I will say we're three of the really good things about the show um, just journalistically because of all the research that goes into it and because of the historical knowledge of the people who do the show it's very helpful to me and i think maybe even to others on the show when we're doing what we most of us were trained to do all of our lives and that's write stories about whatever issues because we get to bounce ideas off of each other Um, there's research that gets done by our researchers who that may uncover something that we didn't realize about a particular topic that may aid us in writing about it or reporting on it. The other thing is that we have a very diverse, it's a very diverse um, panel. You know, we have uh, uh, men and women, um, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, um, religious, You have people all over the country too. Sure, you know, straight, gay, um, we've got, you know, everybody. And I think everybody you know, and everybody gets along and, and likes to have a free um, exchange of ideas. Um, and then the third thing is we're, we're not at all fearful of um, tackling um, thorny issues. In, in fact, I think, I think we are often attracted to, um, to dealing with thorny issues. Uh, and I think we do a good job of it. So, um, yeah, so it's, you know, it's a good show. Yeah, and you're sitting at a little over 300 wins there. It's a pretty good number. <laughs> um, if, if it were baseball, it would get me in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> Is there a journalism Hall of Fame? Um, yeah, there's journal. I mean, I'm in the I'm in the Northwestern. You know, I'm in the Medill School of Journalism's. Uh, I think they call it the Hall of Achievement. Hmm. Um, and uh, I'm very. I'm very honored. You know, it was, it was, it was great getting into that. And I'm also in the, I've I've been honored by the university. And, you know, the great thing about that is you get to, 
you know, my parents aren't with me anymore now, but, um, you know, my mother was alive and I took her up to Chicago for that, for that ceremony. And she was, um, you know, she was very, very pleased. Yeah. And, uh, so, you know, you, you know, you, in, in a lot of ways, you know, you live to, 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 and work to please your, you know, to please your parents more so than yourself. Right. True. That's very true. Now I got to ask you this since I'm a Buckeye and you're a mm -hmm. wildcat. Mm -hmm. you're also, you're also a Terp. How does that, how does that work out for you? Oh, that's, that's, that's easy. Um, you know, your undergraduate alma mater is, is that's, that's your blood. So I, I mean, I grew up around here rooting for, rooting for Maryland. Um, uh, but, um, any, anybody at Maryland, coaches and players in my class know that you know when they're playing when they're playing the purple um when they're playing northwestern i ain't pulling for you i'm pulling for <laughs> northwestern um i have no problems walking into a maryland football stadium or basketball arena uh, when northwestern is here decked out in purple i have no problem with that um <laughs> i'll root for maryland any other time and uh uh, you know, my neighbor across straight across the street is a, is an Ohio Buckeye. Um, you know, and he and I scream at each other when, when the, when our two schools get together. So, you know, it's all, it's, um, it's all good. And I know Gene Smith at um, Ohio state and, uh, um, you know, I'll, I'll root for Ohio state when they're, when they're playing, when they're representing the conference. You got to root for us versus Michigan too. If you got a neighbor across the street, you are a <laughs> Buckeye fan in heart. You got to. When that game comes out, you got to root. Got to root. Got to root. Got to root for Ohio State. Anybody like what I say for any big team, Big Ten team, anybody but Michigan. Anybody but Michigan. Sure, that, <laughs> that, that proves your uh, your pedigree as a Ohio State Buckeye. Yep. Yep. Tried and true. I'm born in Ohio, raised in Cincinnati. Just, I'm a Buckeye. I love okay. my Buckeyes. I played one year at Louisville, played for um, Coach Petrino with Lamar mm -hmm. Jackson and those guys. But Great. Some, some just in my heart was like, Buckeyes, Ohio State, Jeff, you've been, you've been a fan your whole life. You love the school. Like, go. And so that's where I'm at right okay. now. I'm at All Ohio right. State. But as you can see, you got my, got my Louisville jerseys sure. in the background. Sure. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Very good. So, Kevin, one last question. You've done so much in this sport. You know, we said you're a professor, you're a columnist for the Washington Post, you are on ESPN around the horn. What else is there for you to do in this industry? Is there anything else that you have on your mind that you still want to accomplish? Um, yeah, I mean I, I mean, I just, you know, one of the great things about being a journalist is you don't have to retire, right? There's no... You just do whatever you do for as long as you want to do it. Um, and I work at my own pace. You know, the only thing I'm really obligated to do um, is, is teach. Uh, you know, if I don't want to go on TV for a week, I don't have to go on. Um, although, you know, I have a, an agreement to make so many appearances. Um, and I know, you, I know you miss beating up on Woody Page every day. <laughs> <laughs> Woody's a great guy. He's a, he's a great guy. He, um, I know he garners a lot of laughs, um, and rightfully so. He's always been that guy. Um, but you would also be um, amazed to hear about how gracious and thoughtful he is as just a citizen of the world for things that he's done for people out of just the goodness of his heart. Yeah, the Woody that you see on TV, that's him, um, but he has – another dimension to him that is maybe more impressive. Mm. I'll just say that. That's a great. He's, That's he's not, great. he's not going to tell you about it. Nobody talks about it, but it's real. Mm. Well, Kevin, thank you so much for coming on today. Right. Like I said, you've been one of my heroes since youth where watching you on TV, reading your articles. My dad would always send me your articles. I just, wow. <laughs> Read them. Okay. Yes. So I've been a fan of yours for a while, and this means a lot that you took this interview. Well, I appreciate it. Thanks for reaching out.